huge, huge number of <coughs> army. Uh, uh, the army is an idle army. It is not productive. Is that not? You, uh, you, you, you would agree that the army is not a pro productive one. So equality before the law on the paper and on, on, on the ground is completely <coughs> entirely different. If you have any question regarding, uh, regarding to this, uh, I'm ready to give an answer. And I, uh, I want to say and I thank you very much for your kind attention. Before I hand over to uh, the floor for you all to ask questions uh, of the fantastically interesting speakers we've heard from, I thought I would share with you a little bit about what the Bar Council has been doing over the last, or one of the issues that the Bar Council has been very concerned about, and in particular the committee that I chair, the Equality and Diversity Committee of the Bar Council. One of the issues we've been looking at over the last few years, particularly, is the question of diversity in the judiciary itself. Uh, you all know that judges are increasingly required to answer sensitive, political, social questions. And that is increasingly the case. Human rights principles are increasingly informing their judgments on all of these sorts of issues. And that means that the source of their legitimacy is all the more important than ever. Judges aren't elected, they can't look to the ballot box in this country to establish their legitimacy. So they must derive it from some other source. And we know that they derive it from being the most able lawyers. They derive it from being people of great integrity. But they must also, in my view, reflect the society that they represent. Because if the public is to have confidence in judges, a diverse judiciary is an indispensable requirement of democracy. I came to the bar about 25 years ago. When I came to the bar, women and men were coming to the bar in pretty much equal numbers, and it stayed pretty much that way since then. And we've been waiting for the trickle-up effect, that's what it's called. Women will trickle up and they'll progress from the legal profession to the bench. Black and minority ethnic legal practitioners will trickle up from the legal profession to the bench. But unfortunately, that promised trickle-up effect hasn't happened in these 25 years. On the Supreme Court, one out of 11 of the judges is a woman, and none are from uh, black and minority ethnic backgrounds. In the Court of Appeal, four out of 43 of the judges are women. None are from black and minority <coughs> ethnic backgrounds. And on the High Court bench, 17 out of 110 are women, and five out of 110 are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And for the last 10 at least, if not 20 years, there's been a lot of focus. We've got a Judicial Appointments Commission, which selects on, a, on an objective and transparent basis. We've had all sorts of initiatives in order to increase retention of women and black and minority ethnic uh, professionals within the profession. But it isn't having the effect that has been promised all that has been expected. And I raise this, it's not something I would want to advocate, it's not something I would like, but I raise as a question, we heard uh, Lord Kerr talk about Northern Ireland and the police service and the way in which um, measures have been adopted in order to bring parity of representation there. I know in South Africa that there's a black empowerment program and it may be we'll hear more about that in due course. But I wonder whether the time has come for some form of quota. Uh, it's not something I raise 
with any great relish. I certainly wouldn't like to be appointed to the judiciary as a result of a quota, but has the time come? And I've raised that for you to think about. It may be something that you're discussing in your, in your classes. Has the time come for some form of quota? And with that thought, perhaps we can hand over to some questions. If you'd like us to secure the Yes, we should. <laughs> Who's going to start off the questions? Hand over there. Um, this is, uh, I've got two. Okay. This is to um, Justice Edwin Cameron. Um, what were the difficulties you faced, especially being an openly gay um, lawyer during that about about What was? The difficulties and like, the challenges you um, um, faced. The, 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 the legal challenges were that it was a crime and that the police raided uh, and prosecuted gay men and, and they raided uh, uh, groups where people got together. But the, the more difficult thing is, I think, something that our chairperson is speaking about. It's the unspoken, non-legal, inbuilt social prejudices which affect black people uh, still in our country in South Africa, uh, which affect women. Uh, and, and gay people. And as a gay man, I've got a little bit of experience of that. I don't think that being gay is the same as being black or being a woman, but I understand that sense that you are worth less than other people because you are different. And the difficulty with being gay is that it relates to your sexual functioning. You know, with race, it's, 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 it's a genetic difference. It's melanin in your skin. Very beautiful. That's the that's that, that's difference. We melanin deprived. You, you can trace it to, 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 a, to a genetic deficiency. With, with sexual orientation, it's so much more difficult. So the sense of the difficulty of talking about, especially in the rest of Africa, the gay and lesbian movement in South Africa is now led by young black men and women. And in Uganda, where there's terrible oppression still, in East Africa and West Africa, there's terrible targeting of, of, of gays and lesbians throughout Africa. So I experienced that, and that's why I decided, as I said to you earlier, to fight for equality, because I wanted to put that behind me. But I think going back to what uh, our, our chairperson has said, there's still a long way to go. The law offers you a framework, and that was the question that I found so interesting. Should we legislate quotas, or should we use the law as a framework to change people's attitudes? And frankly, like, your, uh, like the chairperson, I'd like to hear some of your views on that. It'd be very interesting to hear. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what do you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think that the law should should force the Traditional Appointments Commission in England to appoint 50% women yeah. as Definitely, judges? Definitely, because look, it's really serious. Because um, the because what we have now, we still have that patriarchal style where men are leading, especially white men. But I think that to have a woman and other ethnic minorities, they can look at it from a different viewpoint and they can look at it differently from someone, let's say, was um, a black person, um, life was in jeopardy, and for a white, a white judge to say what happens to that black person is different because the white judge has, cannot really, does not really have that experience of what that black person must have gone through, but if it was a black judge or woman may understand because they are from re like from the same background, so personally, I just feel that it needs to change, especially when it comes to the gender issue, because I really find it really. I'm sorry, but I think it's really disgusting that um, <laughs> yeah, that only one out of eleven are part of the judiciary, Supreme uh, Court. Yeah, and um, four out of forty-three. I just think that's really like really disgusting because women, because women have fought for liberty and stuff, but not only just for like my, um, minor stuff like domestic labor just we're fighting for like because it's also part of democracy that women also get equal chance and ethnic minorities that's what i wanted to ask um ingrid simon similar simon. Ingrid. Uh, <laughs> ingrid sorry um like how how did you get appointed to such a prestigious job and also being like a woman like what advice can you give us girls especially to like how you got there Okay, well let me deal with that. I, I, I haven't been appointed to a prestigious job. I'm a barrister. 
And the good thing about being a barrister is you are self-employed. You are in control of your own destiny as a barrister. If you're prepared to work extremely hard, if you're prepared to go that extra mile for your client, if you have the uh, confidence in yourself to, to uh, be an advocate in court and to advise clients, you can do it. There's nobody who can stop you from, from doing it. You don't have to be there. Well, let me, let me start that sentence again. Whereas on the solicitor's side of the profession, there is what's been called a presenteeism culture. You have to be seen to be putting in 10 hours a day. You can't leave at 6 o'clock. You have to be seen to be there in the evening. If you want to make partner, you have to be uh, seen to be doing what your male counterparts are doing. There isn't the same presenteeism culture at the bar. So long as you are ready to turn up in court the next day to do your job, it doesn't matter whether you did the preparation at home or in chambers, whether you did the preparation after you put your baby to bed or after you bathed your child or after you read your child a bedtime story. So long as you do the work, nobody is there looking to see when you're doing it or where you're doing it. And that's a huge advantage for women coming to the bar. I think the bar is a great place for women. And I really encourage all you young women out there to come to the bar. I wonder if I, as one of the disgusting majority <laughs> <laughs> in the Supreme Court, could say a word or two about this. Let me tell you a story, a plastic one. It's a story in which I'm not the hero. Uh, and in which I received a very sharp uh, wake-up call. Uh, I, I did a fellowship in America in 1999, and a great friend of mine is a man called Chuck Breyer. He's the brother of uh, Stephen Breyer, a Supreme Court Justice, and Chuck is a federal judge in, uh, in California. He took me to lunch with his uh, fellow judges, uh, and uh, the chief judge, as she was called, was a woman, and quite clearly a majority of the bench were women. Uh, and uh, in the course of the lunch, the chief judge said to me, um, how many judges in the High Court of Northern Ireland are women? And I had to say, I'm afraid none. And I immediately started this pattern. But when I was called to the bar in 1970, there were fewer than 70 people at the bar of whom only one was a woman. Uh, and for many years after I was called, very few women came to the bar. But I explained that young women of superb ability and talent were coming to the bar and that there would be, as Ingrid has put it, in due course, a trickle-up effect. And I have no doubt uh, that in due course there would be women on the High Court in Northern Ireland. And she fixed me with a steely gaze. and she said, don't give me that garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was a wake-up call for me to realize that it's not enough to sit passively and wait for uh, a much uh, anticipated but never seemingly arriving trickle-up effect. Uh, much later in my career as Chief Justice in Northern Ireland, I was the chairman of the Judicial Appointments Commission. Uh, and not only as chairman of that commission, but also as Chief Justice, I was acutely conscious uh, of how wrong it seemed, how wrong it was, uh, and how it must appear to people to be uh, totally uh, uh, wrong that no women were on the high court. And we conceived it as our obligation to embark on a, what's known as a night reach campaign <coughs> to target women uh, at the bar, to talk to them, to understand what the disincentives were because we were not getting applications uh, from women. Now sadly, I'm afraid I didn't achieve my ambition of having a woman come to the bar, but it does seem to me that while there is an obvious obligation uh, on judicial appointments commissions to recognize that there is an imbalance, not only a gender imbalance, but also, also an ethnic uh, imbalance, which is marked and which is a, a stigma on our uh, profession. Uh, and nevertheless, while we have a, a, an obligation to try to do something about it, there is a complementary obligation on the part of young 